My name is Christina Treppendahl. I am a nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner, and I am a headache specialist. I uh, am the founder and director of the Headache Center here in Ridgeland. And we have um, a very large clinic now. We have three full-time providers, and we have about four or five clinical studies going, and we also have in our research department, and we also have a, a nonprofit foundation and some other things that we're working on. But um, a little bit more about me. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner for about 20-something years now, and I've been in headache medicine for almost 10 years. And um, I kind of into headache medicine as a second career and um, since then I've been doing headache only in my practice for 10 years and I started the headache center here about five years ago in 2013 and I am certified in headache medicine by the National Headache Foundation and I am also currently working on a master's of headache disorders program in Copenhagen, Denmark, and that's a two-year program. So I'm very blessed to be able to go work with some of the great headache gods, including Yes Olison and Henrik Schutz and um, Rigmor Jensen, some of my favorite instructors. So a shout out to them. Um, so my topic today is um, what is the value of seeing a headache specialist if you have headache disorders? And um, my goal is that um, by the time I die, that I will have trained uh, about 100 to 1,000 more specialists in headache medicine because there's never going to be enough people to properly treat headache disorders um, well, optimally, the way they should be treated. About almost 40 million Americans have migraine. That's almost 40 million Americans. And some of them have episodic migraine where it only happens once a month or a couple times a year. But some people have chronic migraine, they have medication overuse headache, and there's about 17 different headache disorders out there. So I'm gonna go into the difference about the training that we have to treat headache disorders and then what you might get at a specialty center that you wouldn't get at a general practice or um, a pain management practice or a neurology practice. <clears throat> so I've got some cliff notes here. Um, so headache specialist, the, um, I've got some notes here. The field of headache medicine is relatively new. Um, I'll give some credit uh, where it's due. Uh, yes, Olison is um, a, a neurologist that's been treating headache medicine and he lives in Denmark. And um, in 1988, he got together with a group of world leaders who were treating headache medicine. He got, probably took longer than that. But in 1988, they published the first classification of headache disorders so that everybody could be on the same page about what kind of headache disorder this is and how to rule out certain headache disorders and make sure that they're appropriately treating them right based on science. And um, back then in 1988, in the 80s, a lot of people didn't even believe that headache disorders were a real thing. They actually thought that headache disorders were a um, disorder of um, neurotic women or hysterical women. They didn't know that. They didn't have functional MR, MFRIs um, back there to look and see uh, that there were brain changes and what, what lights up in the brain during migraine. So they didn't know a whole lot. So the field of neurology has been evolving. The field of headache medicine has been evolving. But basically, headache medicine is a subspecialty of neurology because they discovered that it was not a disorder of your blood vessels. It's not a vascular disorder. They discovered that migraine is a neurovascular disorder. It's a um, disorder of the trigeminovascular system. And they've been learning more and more and more as science is getting advanced. And that's really exciting. So this belongs in the bucket of neurology. Headache does. And neurology is the study of the brain and the peripheral nervous system or the spine. So it's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and all the disorders that are affected by those. So but if you took the whole world of neurology, uh, headache disorders are the most prevalent neurologic disorder on the planet. And the prevalence, meaning how many people have it in a given year, is larger than all the other neurologic conditions combined. But, however, this is when it gets tricky. Not every neurologist is a specialist in headache medicine. Neurolog um, the number one referral to a neurologist is for the chief complaint of headaches. So if you go to your primary care or your urgent care or your ER um, and they can't 
fix your headache disorder, they're going to send you probably to a neurologist unless they know of a specific headache specialist in town that could be a, of a different um, background. They might have a background in family. They might have a background in internal medicine. Um, some people in women's health, pain management. So you can come from any different background in medicine or nursing and be a headache specialist. So I'm going to give you some statistics later on. So, um, and I've got some statistics right here I want to read to you. So basically, and I'm going to read this. This straight comes out of an article, and um, we had a symposium, and this comes from uh, Dr. Peter McAllister. He is in Connecticut, and I'm going to take this quote so I don't misquote. Um, the first United Council of Neurologic Subspecialties certification in headache medicine was offered in 2006. So that's pretty recent, just barely over 10 years ago. And 106 physicians took the test and 105 passed. Now there are currently 484 board certified headache specialists that are certified by the United Council of Neurologic Subspecialties. But since there are about 38 million Americans who have migraine, if all of those subspecialists were treating headache disorders, each one would have to see 215 headache patients per day, 365 days a year. So you can see that there are not enough headache specialists out there. So there's a, um, the nurse practitioners are not allowed to sit for the certification exam by the United Council of Neurologic Subspecialties because they're not doctors. And um, some other people are not allowed to sit for that exam. So the National Headache Foundation realized that more people needed to be treated for their headache disorders. And they have an examination, the National Headache Foundation does, that can get you certified in headache medicine. So basically, you can be certified in headache um, medicine two different ways, from the UCNS or from the National Headache Foundation. But the true, what ma truly makes somebody a headache specialist is their passion for treating headache disorders and headache disorders only. So, um, and I'll go into that a little bit. But basically, um, and also I want you to know that treating headache and migraine, migraine's the number one headache disorder that we treat in headache centers besides medication overuse headache. But treating headache properly without the use of narcotics and barbiturates You've got to invest a lot of time and extra energy in that. So um, over the course of 10 years, I've been to about 100 conferences, um, always trying to learn something new to treat somebody about headache medicine or, or to, to help get them better. So we have some patients who are very lucky or blessed in that they very rarely have a headache, but when they do have a headache, it is severe enough that their medications that they've taken over the counter or their medication given to them by primary care or their general practitioner or urgent care or OBGYN, whatever they were given is not effective. It's not working. So an effective attack medicine for migraine should make them totally pain-free within two hours and not have any other associated symptoms or disability. But we're not that great at headache medicine right now. Actually, Dr. Richard Lipton did a study and it said that about 48% of patients who fit the criteria for migraine have never been diagnosed with migraine. They've never gotten the diagnosis. So if they've never gotten the diagnosis, you can imagine they're not getting great treatment. And right now with the evolution of science, we've had a lot of great treatment come out for migraine that nobody knows about. They tried something 20 years ago, it didn't work, and then they never went back for treatment. And so they haven't gotten a great connection. So I've got some bullet points. And I'm going to go through anything that I've missed so far. But um, in a neurology residency program, uh, they've looked at that in the studies. Um, in a neurology program, three years of residency training, a lot of the uh, physicians in that training don't have more than two or three weeks, maximum four weeks in headache medicine out of that three years. So just because they have a neurology residency doesn't make them an expert in headache, for sure. And people in, in neurology might want to uh, be experts in other things. Some people are experts in um, seizure disorders, so they're called epi, um, epileptologists. And some people are uh, uh, experts in neuromuscular disease. And so there's a lot of different disease states that people might have an affinity for treating those patients. And so we all kind of gravitate one direction. 
I am not good at treating diabetes. I'm not your hypertension expert. And it's great that we all kind of have an affinity for something where we kind of start wanting to learn more and more and more because we're very interested in it. So I would say a headache specialist can be any, anything from a neurologist to a psychologist to a PhD scientist to a nurse practitioner to a physician's assistant to anybody who is dedicating their career to headache medicine. And that means going to conferences, reading journal articles, uh, the published data, looking at the science and seeing what's new coming out and staying on top of their field in headache medicine. And we'll look at my notes really quickly. So, the, um, make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so I talked to you a little bit about training. So training can be trained as a physician, a nurse practitioner, a nurse educator, um, PhD scientists and psychologists, dentists. We have dentists and oral facial surgeons. Anybody can be a headache specialist. Um, talking about different um, backgrounds that they came from, some of my uh, best mentors in headache medicine have been in other specialties. Um, Roger Cady is a family medicine doctor. Um, he's a great headache mentor of mine. Dr. Seymour Diamond is, not, I think, called the godfather of headache disorders, uh, godfather of headache, and he um, opened up the Diamond Headache Center. It's very famous in Chicago. He was a family doctor who just happened to love treating headache disorders because a lot of people just didn't want to treat those patients. And then uh, there's lots of doctors that have internal medicine degrees. Um, I work with Dr. Tim Smith. He, he helps me with research, and he's excellent. He's a Mississippi native. And then Dr. Vince Martin, I believe, is internal medicine physician in Cincinnati, and he runs a big headache program and a headache fellowship program. We have ER-trained physicians. Um, Merle Diamond, who is Seymour Diamond's uh, daughter, is uh, an emergency um, medicine physician. She thought she didn't want to go into the family business, which is headache, but she actually loves it and is passionate about it, and she's a great headache mentor, and I've uh, spent time with her at the Diamond Headache Center. And then people who are in pain management, uh, even though other pain disorders are treated differently than headaches, some people start wanting to know more, and some people are uh, dual board certified in both pain management, and then they go and get uh, headache certification and, and try to keep up with what the latest is in that. And then, like I talked about training and conferences, there's fellowship training. Right now, I think there's about 38 programs that will train uh, residents who have finished a neurology residency in headache medicine, but there's a very big lack of enthusiasm for those neurologists to go into headache medicine. And I have an article on that I'll show you as well. Um, you can learn on the job working with a headache provider. That's how I learned. I worked with a neurologist who was trained in headache medicine for three years. And then as you continue to do your continuing education units that you have to do and go into conferences, you can, um, certain people will go and get fellowship training. Currently there's not a fellowship training for nurse practitioners, but we um, have started a nonprofit foundation and we're working on getting the first accreditation for nurse practitioners and PAs in headache medicine. So that's something that we're working towards. And then um, not only do you get your own knowledge, you pass on the knowledge to the next generation. So you work on research and then you train other people. You train other residents, other fellows, other nurse practitioners and get them excited about headache medicine. And then headache medicine can be taught in universities. I mean, headache medicine, your practice could be in a university setting. It could be in a private clinic, like we have a private clinic. It can be academic where you're teaching others and research, like I said. But w what's one thing that you're going to get at a headache specialty center or from a headache specialist that you might not actually get anywhere else? It's a diagnosis. And that's kind of important. Um, a lot of people don't, cannot tell you the criteria for diagnosing migraine, which is the number one thing that we treat in headache centers. And they can't even tell you the source of where they get that diagnostic criteria from. So some people think that you diagnose migraine or a cluster headache or something with a scan. And scans rule out bad things, but scans do not, um, they're not a diagnostic or biologic marker for having a primary headache disorder. So the, what I referred to is the International Classification of Headache Disorders. This is in the, um, the International Headache Society publishes this as as often as it comes out, and they review it every five to 10 years with the world's leaders in headache medicine. And basically, it tells you how to diagnose that disorder. 
And then once you've realized how to di that, di diagnose that disorder properly and how to rule out the bad things that everybody's worried about their brain tumor or do I have MS, once you've ruled out the bad things, then you can focus on teaching those patients how to manage their disorder. Because if they have a primary headache disorder, it's not going to go away with the magic wand. I don't have a magic wand in here and my crystal ball is broken. So we're going to have to try certain things, just like if you were diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension. So diagnosis is key. And the diagnosis is not based on scans. The diagnosis is actually based on your history. So we have to get a good history. We have to get your medical history outside of headache. We have to get all your medications you're on. And then we have to get your headache history. And that's almost like three different things. And then we have to get it in order because you might tell it to us backwards. So we got to get it in the right boxes. And we've, we're ruling out things when we ask these questions. So let us get the right questions out because we're ruling out bad things. We're, trying to decide if it's this category or that category. And then if you've got a, a really good history, after that you're gonna do a thorough exam, a physical exam, and you're gonna focus on the eye exam, which is called a fundoscopic exam, and you're gonna focus on the neurologic exam and reflexes. So if all of that's normal, which with usually with primary headache disorders, meaning there's nothing bad that's gonna kill you or make you sick, but you just have this genetic predisposition, pre disposition to have episodic headaches or chronic headaches. So if all of that is normal and we don't see any red flags, then we can give you a diagnosis. But if we see some red flags, we're going to have to go investigate more. We're going to have to either order a scan or um, order some labs or order a sleep study or send you to the ophthalmologist or sometimes send you to the cardiologist. It just depends on what's going on with your history. Another thing that you'll get in the um, headache um, provider's office, headache specialist, is you're going to get an education. Now, if you go to my website or the American Migraine Foundation's website or National Headache Foundation's website, there is an endless amount of teaching that can be done on headache disorders. I cannot do it all in one day. I cannot do it all in one hour for one patient. So even if I spent two hours with a patient, usually they say they're exhausted listening to me after that two hours. But, um, and then I have a, um, one of my techs, my techs are highly trained to, to know everything that I know based on the handouts that I'm going to give them and the plan. So you're going to get education. So you're not just going to get somebody write your script and say, go to the pharmacy and pick that up. You got to get education about what does your diagnosis mean? What does this mean for how you should uh, uh, train yourself to have better sleep habits, better diet habits, not skip meals, not take naps, not um, get dehydrated not to have too much sugar, too much caffeine, uh, how to uh, keep the obesity under control, which is a big issue here in Mississippi, and it's becoming a United States problem, but also triggers. I had a patient this morning, she said, did all that caffeine I took in those diet pills, did that cause this? Well, that was not the cause. The cause was she has a migraine disorder. Did that play a part in it? Was it a catalyst? Absolutely. Six caffeine pills per day is probably not a good idea if you have the gene for hemiplegic migraine. So education is key. I can't do it all in one two hour sitting. We re-teach every single time they come back for a follow up. So I'm gonna kinda of go through some of the education, but we also gotta talk about comorbidities and that's why a lot of people who don't like treating headache disorders at all because it comes not with just a headache. It's a, it's a lot of stuff. We've got comorbidities. Comorbidities include if you're obese, you might have more headache disorders. So obesity, we've got to attack that issue. If you have aura, we have to make sure that you, your cardiovascular health is getting under control because you're going to be at more risk for a stroke. And we have to teach you all about that. Say there is a reason you need to go get your labs tested every year and check your cholesterol and check your blood pressure and make sure that's all under control. And then anxiety and depression. Unfortunately, it's a huge comorbidity of migraine. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't try to practice psychiatry here, but I can help people get to the right psychologist or the right psychiatrist. And in our headache practices, we do prescribe some antidepressant medication. One thing that we don't like to do is we don't like to do any um, controlled substances that would get you addicted and make things worse. So we don't do controlled substances in our clinic. The best clinics try to stay away from benzodiazepines, anything in the Xanax, Valium, Ativan category, and we try to stay away or we stay away from the opioids, the narcotics, and the barbiturates. 
because those things are only going to make things worse. And if you go into headache conferences all the time, if you're reading the literature, all the published data says it's just going to make things worse. So the best thing is to get rid of that stuff. Also, if you leave your provider's office and they haven't given you both a, well, a lot of things, a diet and lifestyle plan, a prevention plan, an attack plan, and a headache diary, you're not getting adequately treated. Because if you don't know how to go get an, an app for your headache diary or have a printed one that I love and I'm going to show it to you in a minute, if you don't have a diary in your hand or know that you're responsible for writing down every time you have a big headache or a little headache and what medications you took, then, then you're not, it's just not going to work out well. You're not going to get optimal treatment. Another thing is if they're going to see you back in three months and not necessarily the best thing to, if you put somebody on a new medication would be to see them back in four to six weeks, if at all possible. Now, a lot of my colleagues are the best in the world and they still can't get people in closer than three months. That's why we need to train more people in headache medicine so we can see them every four to six weeks, especially when they're having a daily headache and abusing too many attack medicines so that we can make sure that all of their plan is working and not just one portion and that we can really um, uh, maneuver that plan with them in a partnership slowly and get them to optimal relief sooner rather than later. And if, um, if I don't make sense, you can just ask me to clarify something later on. So, and we give you a toolbox. I think Roger Cady and some other people coined the term the migraine toolbox because if I give you a medication to take for your headache and you tell me you vomited it and then you ended up in the ER, that didn't do you much good, did it? Okay, so I have to make sure that you have prevention so that you try not to have headaches. I also have to make sure that you have an attack medicine that's going to work. And what if you vomit it? I need to make sure you have a non-oral attack plan. So I need to make sure you have an injectable or a nasal spray or a rectal suppository or a patch. I have to make sure that there's some way you can get that drug into you no matter what. And sometimes it has to be a three drug combination. We always give our patients an attack plan if it's a simple migraine patient, we give them an attack plan of an NSAID plus a tryptan plus an anti-medic that won't make them sleepy that also has evidence in migraine that it's going to shut down the migraine. And then we make sure that they have other options. If somebody only has eight tryptans per month, what are they going to do on that ninth day of that headache? So you've got to give them enough tools in their tool basket because I'm not home, I'm not taking call on nights, weekends, and holidays, I want them to have everything that they need so that they never end up in the emergency room. Plus, we have some more things. What if it is your worst headache and you've tried your triptans, your NSAIDs, and your antiemetics, and you've done everything I've told you to do the right way for two or three days and you're still in what we call status migranosis? Is we have the op options that you, if you're part of a headache center, you can call us and say, I'm on a three-day headache, nothing's working. So we'll get you in that same day or the next day for either IV infusion therapy, that's not controlled substances, no hydromorphone here, so no Dilaudid here. So, but we can give you on proven efficacious drugs that per IV work a lot better than the gut does. Look up Sheena Aurora, she did all the evidence on the gut's not working in migraine. And if, if, if we choose, we could do a sphenopalatine ganglion block or we could do an occipital nerve block plus or peripheral nerve blocks. We've got all sorts of nerve blocks. If the nerve blocks don't work, if the uh, IV infusion doesn't work, we can change your prevention plan. We can get you a better attack plan. We also have samples. This is stuff that we're doing. I think we saw 50 something patients today. We're doing this all day long in a headache specialty practice. So, and we love it. We have the opportunity. Um, I think I have 11 uh, uh, females on my staff and uh, about, nine or 10 of them have migraine. And so they know what it's like to go through a migraine. So they're very empathetic towards the patients. I've never had a migraine myself, but I still love my migraine patients. And they know that I, I get that what they're saying is true and honest. Also, um, if you're going to a place that doesn't uh, treat with narcotics, um, you don't have to worry about, is this person seeking narcotics in my practice? Because if you've told them on the front end, you're not gonna do that, they're really there to get better. And we actually, uh, give a card to our patients to tell them. So a lot of our patients travel three hours away or they travel four hours away, one way to come see us. So we're in the center of the state in Mississippi, but somebody might be coming from Sardis or 
or the Gulf Coast or the East or the West. Some people come from Alabama, Louisiana, we've got Arkansas, we have Florida. If they're driving four hours one way, when they get back home, they might need an emergency treatment there. So we give them a card that says, if I have to end up in urgent care or an emergency room, give me X, Y, and Z, like um, IV prochlorperazine and Benadryl and Toradol and a triptan injectable. Don't give me narcotics. And if they go in with that card, the emergency medicine uh, doctors and nurse practitioners are going to treat them a little bit better because they know that they're really suffering from a headache that they want it to go away and that they're not just drug seeking, um, which is a good thing. So um, another thing that I would say you get, and hold on, I gotta look down, I got one of the notes, is you're gonna get a safe place because a lot of patients that come see us, they cry on their first visit or they cry when we're doing patient teaching because they say, and if you look at the reviews on our website as well, but they say, this is the first time anybody's ever really listened to my story, and this is the first time anybody's really given me any hope. So we give you a safe place. So you know um, some of our cluster headache patients, unfortunately, they'll wait in the parking lot at 3 a.m. till we get here if they need a nerve block for their cluster or if they've started a new cluster cycle and they know that they need an emergency treatment. They're not gonna go to the ER. They actually wait in our parking lot till we get here because they know we will not turn them down if they're an established patient that we know the diagnosis of. And um, so they've got a safe place and they've got a friend in the, in the staff that the whole entire staff here is multi-trained to treat your headache disorder. And so it's not just the doctor or the nurse practitioner that knows how to treat migraine or cluster or hemicrania or high pressure headaches or low pressure headaches. We are all working towards that common goal of getting you better. Um, you get advocacy. So I know you're on the American Migraine Foundation, so you are obviously reaching out, trying to get more education and trying to share your stories with other people. And that has a lot of value to patients who are still suffering, who are not getting better. And it's also value to the people who are better, who want to help the other people across the road. So we have support groups. We have local support groups. We have national support groups. We have support groups that are just online. And we want to start regional support groups everywhere where people who have migraine get together and they can have somebody come in who is a professional who just sits there and answers questions if they're asked, but basically it's a patient centered thing. And then partnerships. Um, if I try to write a plan for you um, uh, and you, you say, I'm never going to take that medicine because I'm afraid it's going to make me fat or that medicine's going to make me stupid or I, I don't trust you or I don't trust you saying if the patient's not going to take the medicine as directed the plan is not going to work. So we really have to sit in that room and we have to work out this partnership together. So I'm going to show you an example of a plan as well. And I should look at time. So it's almost been 30 minutes. I'm going to show you some of the patient teaching. I'll show you a little bit of the clinic and then I'll show you what a plan looks like. Um, so when you come to us, I, I write a plan and I, of course I didn't bring the plan in. The plan tells you all the different things you're going to take to a attack your headache, prevent your headache, and also lifestyle management, headache diary, all the things that you have to do in the next month before I see you again. Um, and the most important thing, which I can't find it right now, is the headache diary. So don't ever leave your headache practice without a headache diary. Now I'm old school, I like this handwritten one, or I'm sorry, it's just a written one, where I tell people, put in the month up there, so you'd put in the month January, then you see February and March, don't write anything if you don't have a headache, but a lot of people never report the small headaches. So I say, if you have a headache that's a one or a two on the pain scale, so it, you might have just a little neck pain, face pain, head pain, one or two on the pain scale and you didn't take any medicine, you still have to write little h down, write a little h on January 3rd. If you had a headache that you would call a migraine headache or you took a migraine specific medication, write a big M. And then if you took a medication, you can put X down. But basically, if you don't have a headache, don't write anything down. So what I like to see, what I love about this one, is that when they first come see me, this is really full. A lot of stuff's going on up there. But as the prevention gets better and everything gets better, hopefully we get down to only one or two smatherings of headaches down here. Because the goal of prevention is to cut your headache days in half, get the severity down, let your attack medicines work better, and decrease the number of attack medications you have to take, and then cut that down in half again if we can get further. So... And we like to layer on some medication that's going to be tolerable in a headache practice. So if you're not getting a headache diary, you have to have a headache diary. But there are plenty online that you can find. 
I think on our website and many websites, you can find all the online diaries. So what else would you get? So when my patients leave, they take this bag and it has everything that I give them in there. The samples, the coupons, everything. So diet. I told you about diet and lifestyle. So this is, um, you can get this on many different websites, but this is just about a low tyramine diet. Certain things might be food triggers for certain people in migraine. So that's a good one. Um, but there's many different other things we have to teach about. Some people are night owls. They want to stay up all night and only get four hours sleep or they want to take naps, or they want to have an erratic sleep schedule. Well, that's not good for migraine. So we've got articles about how to have good sleep hygiene. I'm not going to go into all the details. But if you um, email me, I could get you any of this. Headache, headache and sleep disorders. Uh, sleep disorders are a huge comorbidity of migraine. So we're treating insomnia. We're treating oversleeping. We're treating uh, people who have sleep apnea. If you have a daily headache and you're obese, you could have sleep apnea. So we order a lot of sleep studies. Um, also, a lot of people are misdiagnosed with chronic migraine when they actually have a low or a high pressure headache. So this is Dr. Ian Carroll's uh, 48 hour test. And so we work with, that's another thing you get with the headache specialist is that you have access to all the other headache specialists in the country. So when a patient of mine says, I'm moving to California, I say, tell me what county or what city, and I can get on the, the email. We have these um, regional uh, headache society listserv where we can go and find out where the best headache specialist in that area is and then we can get them a referral to that immediately. So that's good because like I said, not everybody's certified in headache medicine. You might have somebody in Iowa who's a great headache practitioner who sees 88, 90% of their practice is all headache, but they might not be certified or recognized yet. So, but we in our inner circle, we know who the good ones are because we're constantly at these meetings. Also, how to treat your migraine early. This is from the um, headache toolbox. So. If our patient's just now getting the diagnosis of migraine, they're going to need to know all about it. So it's like if I diagnose somebody with diabetes today, I wouldn't say, here's your insulin, your glucose, your AccuChecks, and uh, metformin, good luck. You don't do that. You actually have to do the patient teaching, and I can't do it all in one minute. So I'm going to run through these. We have about a 1,000 of them. So prevention of migraine, this one goes into the blood pressure medicines, anti-seizure medicines, nutraceuticals, which are vitamins that have some efficacy and anti-seizure medicines that we borrowed. But now there's a whole new class of medications that have come out. I'm sure you've seen some Facebook Live promos about the uh, CGRP monoclonal antibodies that just came out. And that's huge. That's changed things a lot. Um, level of evidence. So this is from the American Academy of Neurology. This is level A evidence, means that it's got a lot of controlled, placebo-controlled large trials showing that that actually works. The problem is a lot of these old ones that are on this list, they worked, but they had nasty side effects. So somebody said in the old days, she, she asked her, she, she realized she had migraine and um, she asked um, if what her options were for headache treatment. And she said, my options were sleepy and fat or skinny and, and stupid. And the person said, I'll take skinny and stupid, please. But we have better options now. I've got a million of these handouts. I don't know if my time limit makes me have to go off at 30 minutes or not. Can somebody tell me if I have to go off? Okay, I'm gonna keep on going until somebody tells me to shut down. So, this is about sinus headache. Um, everybody in Mississippi thinks they have sinus headache, but uh, sinus he headache is actually the street term for migraine. So we showed them about that. More about level of evidence. This is in the attack um, prevention medications, and we've got them for attack medications. What is migraine? So you should get a whole handout full of all the different things that might pertain, A, to your illness and diagnosis, B, to how to take care of it, and C, how to um, uh, attack it when it comes and how to prevent it. And then you should be followed up closely every four to six weeks until you're better. And you should also have a place that you can go for IV infusions or nerve blocks. And I'm going to try, try to start answering questions because I think I've talked too much. And then if we have time, I'll show people some of the rooms in the clinic. One thing we do have is a very quiet clinic. It's dark, no outside windows in the patient exam rooms. And we have dimmers on the lights and we keep it, the noise under control and there's not loud TVs everywhere. So let me see if I can have some questions. Uh, Wendy says that she's been on Amavig since May. And I'm not sure what the question was. When was it approved? Um, Amavig was approved in May. Mm. What can be done if migraine medication causes rebound headaches? Okay, 
Attack medications can cause rebound headaches, so that's a great question. We want you to keep your headache attack medicines. Try to limit the number of attack days that you're treating to two or three days per week. That can be very hard if you do not have good prevention in place yet. We're in a study with Dr. David Dodick and Todd Sweat at the Mayo Center in Scottsdale. It's called the Medication Overuse Treatment Strategy Clinical Trial, and it's going on for three years. Go look that up. It's called the MOTS trial, and there's a website for it. It's M-O-T-S trial. Go look up MOTStrial.gov. But there's a lot of information about medication overuse. Basically, you need a practitioner who's going to work hard to layer on your prevention so you don't need to tap medicines that often, and you can do some bridge therapies in between, like nerve blocks, or sometimes people do steroids. I hate to do steroids. They cause bad things to happen. But you can do a short burst of steroid tapers. Uh, there's lots of things we can do that are Band-Aid treatment until we get your prevention better. And if we can't fix you, we send you to somewhere else that can. We also can send people to the hospital locally for IV DHE infusions. And we can also send them to Diamond Headache Center, to Jefferson Headache, to the Mayo Clinic for um, a reevaluation of we can't get this person better. We also send people to Duke University and Stanford for low and high pressure headache disorders. And that's not a primary headache disorder, but it's often misdiagnosed. So if somebody says you have chronic migraine, but you never get down to zero and none of your prevention and attack plan works, you might have a secondary headache disorder that's not been recognized. And that could be a, a higher low pressure disorder. Okay. So somebody said, so it's true, every time I see a doctor, it's try, hear this met. Unfortunately, that's what medicine is in general. I have psoriasis, some people have diabetes, some people have hypertension. There is not gonna be one drug that works for everybody. But make sure, and a lot of times, we can find some success in something that you think you've already tried and failed. So a lot of people said, I failed Topamax and I failed Imitrex. Well, Topamax, they started on 25 milligrams and they never got any further and it didn't work. Well, that's, I can give a baby 75 milligrams. And Imitrex, the adult dose is 100. You're supposed to start at the highest dose. So a lot of times, it's getting that real good history. And, and every time I go see a new patient, I usually have a student with me, and I love this because this lady I um, triaged yesterday morning, she was a physician. I said, how many headaches are you having per month? She said, I have at least 10 mild headaches per month and at least 10 migraineous headaches per month. And I said, okay, so that mean that other 10 days, completely pain-free in your head, face, or neck? And she said, no. So I said, do you have a headache just about every day? And she says, I have a headache just about every day. But the history... You're not gonna get that history. Nobody's gonna tease that out of you if you're not going to headache specialty practice. Mm. Somebody's praying that HIV works. We've got three new monoclonal antibodies that are out there. Um, Amovig, Ajovi, and Mgality. They are all working well for a lot of our patients. I can't say enough good stuff about them. So if you have headaches, and you're thinking about starting a CGRP monoclonal antibody, I can tell you that these drugs were designed specifically based on the pathophysiology of what was discovered goes on during a migraine. So your inflammatory process happens. You get the trigeminal nerve activation. Then the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic branch, feeds into the menin meninges where your blood vessels are. And so you have uh, ar arteries and veins in the lining of your brain, and those are surrounded by nerve endings from the trigeminal uh, nerve and what happens is you get this activation and once you get this activation you get this sterile inflammatory cascade which causes vasodilation of the blood vessels and pain CGRP happens to be one of those neurotransmitters that was discovered and indicated and they found out that by blocking it they could block migraine pain and migraine symptoms so a lot of patients are seeing really good relief that never got any relief from any other drugs before so we have uh, borrowed categories of headache medicine, um, but that can be very effective for some people. I have tons of miracles on topiramate and, and Botox, but uh, the CGRP monoclonal antibodies are really good. Um, and I would just make sure that you uh, work with a, if you have a, are sitting with somebody who you think is not enth enthusiastic about getting to the root of your problem and getting you better, then go find somebody else and look at their reviews online and ask who's the best headache specialist in my area or call us. We know the best headache specialist in every area. We, whatever area you're in, we're going to try to get you that referral. How can you get 
help with migraine when you have high blood pressure. So, um, like I said, I'm not a high blood pressure expert, but we do have medications that work both for blood pressure and headache. So at a headache specialist, a lot of times we'll try you on propranolol or lisinopril or candesartan. Now, lisinopril and candesartan don't have great evidence in migraine, only propranolol and timolol and metoprolol. Um, but sometimes those have side effects and you can't tolerate them. We can get your blood pressure down in a normal range usually so that you can take migraine specific, specific attack medication that works better. So we're always looking at your blood pressure, your anxiety, your sleep, and all your comorbidities to try to make it work so that you can take the best medicines. We, most of our patients who have migraine may have some degree of hypertension. So we're used to treating that in headache practices. If anybody has any questions for me, um, you can uh, look me up. Um, uh, I have the Headache Center here in Ridgeland. Uh, our website is MississippiMigraineCenter.com, or you could um, email me at my name, Christina Treppendahl, at gmail.com. And I would love to answer questions for you or your provider. And if you know more nurse practitioners and physician's assistants or family doctors that want to get trained in headache medicine, please send them our way because we need more boots on the ground. And just say no to the benzos, the narcotics, and the barbiturates. Anybody have any other questions? I'm going to give a little tour of the clinic then before I say goodbye. Um, I'm still here. Everybody left. But so this is the most important thing. This is the big wall of education. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but when a patient comes through here, they get a plan and it has a lot of information on it. So they'll get a bag and then we go through and give them their headache diary and all those many things that I was telling you about. So sometimes they have a, an odd headache that a lot of other people don't have. If you have a locked one-sided headache, you might have something called hemicrania or a cluster headache or, or something in what we call the TACs. Um, and also having a dedicated infusion room that's a quiet place for people. So we have three beds in this room. I'm not sure if you can see. They're very comfortable beds, little leather beds, um, chase lounges, I guess you would call them. We um, have IV infusion in here. We have earbuds so that we can block out the noise for you. And we have eye masks in here for you. And it's very therapeutic. In all our exam rooms, we have the ability to dim and keep it quiet in here. And, and we try to keep the noise out of the waiting room. We uh, don't have a TV out there. And we have some water fountains. Sometimes we have to turn off our water fountains if somebody says they're too noisy. Um, and then I'm going to show you just a typical exam room. We um, have it dark in here. It's a dark gray color. And all of our exam rooms, we can turn the lights down. And all of our exam rooms, we can do procedures like nerve blocks, peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, we also do allergy testing because allergies and asthma are a huge comorbidity of migraine. And uh, we do a lot of Botox for chronic migraine. And then in a couple of the other rooms that you can't see right now, we're doing research and clinical trials. So. Um, we are very eager for new medications to come out for migraine because uh, uh, for many years, migraine was kind of overlooked as the redheaded stepchild. Oh, and I'm going to read that if anybody's still on. Um, so this is the article from Peter McAllister that I was referring to. Um, and then I'm going to say goodbye. Hold on. Let me find that article. And he said, unfortunately, for many neurologists, headache medicine is the redheaded stepchild of our field. Neglected in medical school and residency training, headache medicine is too often considered inferior for so-called real or hardcore neurology that encompasses disorders considered more serious. Well, just so you'll know, headache specialists that train in, in headache medicine love to treat headache disorders, and we would love to train more headache specialists and um, get more people adequately treated because a lot of um, money is lost to our societies each year in the indirect cost and the economic, economic burden of headache disorders. Um, I'd love to do this again. If you have any questions, please contact me on email or through my website. And um, thank you for having me.